Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. And as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to the left side of the aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me and that I think are worthy of your intention uh, and uh, worthy of uh, being important to you as well. Uh, as always, if you have any comments, questions, reactions, whatever, to the show, you can contact me directly. My email address is whoviating, that's W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Uh, and uh, if you didn't catch that, my uh, website, which is Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be displayed around here somewhere uh, a couple times during the show. And you can do a search on that, go to the website, get the email address from there. And yes, I do answer my email. I'm sometimes, uh, sometimes a little slow about it, but I do answer it. All right, this week uh, I've got uh, several things I wanted to cover. Uh, several of them are going to be uh, like updates on things I've talked about before. But I have to actually start with a correction. Last week I was talking about how the Occupy movement had already had a visible impact on uh, political things in the country, including how the governor of New York had uh, changed his position on the extension of a surtax on the income of millionaires. Uh, unfortunately, I refer to Governor Mario Cuomo. It is, of course, Governor Andrew Cuomo. All right, first off, a few weeks ago, I, uh, I talked to you about um, voter suppression, about this new wave of voter ID laws that are supposed to combat this non-existent uh, deluge of uh, polling place voter fraud, but whose actual impact and actual intent is to suppress voter turnout among more likely to be liberal leaning uh, um, constituencies. Well, now I have a little bit of more powerful backup in that. Attorney General Eric Holder uh, recently denounced these, uh, these various laws and actually suggested, hinted that the Department of Justice may challenge some of them in court. Um, he said, voting rights were being attacked in, and I'm quoting him here, a deliberate and systematic attempt to prevent millions of elderly voters, young voters, students, and minority and low income voters from exercising their constitutional right to engage in the democratic process. Uh, in fact, he proposed, I found this interesting, he proposed that the federal government automatically register all citizens to vote. Now, Despite this, at the same time, some media is still insisting that this is a real topic of debate. Uh, and remember, what we're talking about here, these voter ID laws, the only kind of fraud that they address is uh, polling place fraud. That is, you go to the polling place pretending to be someone else and vote in their name. That's, that's the only kind of fraud these, uh, um, these laws address, and some media is still acting like this is a real controversy about these laws, about, these, about the extent of fraud. In fact, just the other day, in covering Holder's remarks, the Washington Post claimed, and I'm quoting again, studies of the issue have reached different conclusions on the extent of the problem. This is even though the vast majority, in fact, virtually all studies have said that there really isn't any such problem, that the numbers involved are vanishingly small. When this reporter was asked for his basis for this assertion, uh, he referred to a report from the Electoral Assistance Commission. This is from December 2006, this report came out, which uh, seemed to indicate that there was still a good deal of debate about how extensive voter fraud is. However, a few months after that report came out, the New York Times, USA Today, and the Washington Post were reporting that this report actually distorted, this executive summary that was released actually distorted the body of the report. In fact, the Times said it ignored the findings of its own experts in order to claim this. And the Washington Post said that the body of the report argued that there was widespread agreement that there was little polling place fraud. In fact, uh, one of the authors of the, of the actual report uh, a woman named Tova Andrea Wang, she wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post about how her findings, the actual research findings, had been, she said, stood on their head. And still, the Washington Post now is reporting like this is a big controversy and there really is a lot of debate about this. Don't the people at the Washington Post read their own paper? 
All right, another thing to catch up on. Last week, I told you about the National Defense Authorization Act. This is the bill that authorizes expenditures on military and, and uh, counterterrorism needs and so on. I noted that that bill, the Senate version of the bill, contained provisions that would allow the military, in fact, in some cases require the military, to detain anyone, any civilian, including U.S. civilians, on U.S. soil and hold them without charge without trial indefinitely, just for as long as they want. Um, and that uh, the only requirement here is that there is a hearing where this person would be accused of being associated with Al-Qaeda or associated groups. Or to put it more bluntly, we accuse you of being a terrorist. That's all that's required. I said the only bright spot in this was that the House bill, House version of this bill, had not contained that provision and that maybe it will be stripped out in conference. Uh, conferences when uh, representatives of each House of Congress get together to iron out differences between the versions of the bill. Well, it was not stripped out. It's still there. There are a couple of purely cosmetic changes. One change uh, moves the authority to waive the provisions from the Defense Department to the President. And another one says that, well, civilian law authority, uh, authorities can still investigate and interrogate suspects even, even though they're being held in military custody. So how that's going to work in the real world, nobody seems to know. The point is there's no change in the authority to detain U.S. civilians taken on, even on U.S. soil indefinitely, without trial, without charge. It is a bill to authorize disappearing American citizens. And again, if you don't know what it means to disappear someone, look it up. Now, why are they doing Why are they doing this? What's the support of this? Well, Senator Lindsey Graham, he's a Republican senator from the state of wet my pants. Um, he declared that the bill affirms that the homeland, and it always creeps me out when somebody refers to the United States as the homeland. The echoes of old regimes in other countries uh, echoes too strongly for me. But the homeland, he said, is part of the battlefield. And he said the military must not have its hands tied. Now, this bill also, by the way, bars closing the Guantanamo Bay prison. In fact, it would have to be expanded under this bill for all the new people that the military is going to be holding. This is despite the fact that other countries already are unwilling to send people, terrorists that they've captured, to the U.S. if they're going to be sent to Gitmo. This bill is horrendous. All the, all the bad parts of it are still there. Barack Obama has threatened to veto this bill. He'd better come through with that threat. He'd better come across with it. Or another thing to catch up on. I talked, uh, I, think, I think it was last week, about uh, the Stop Online Piracy Act, or SOPA. This is a bill in the House that would destroy the Internet in order to save it. Uh, it, uh, this bill is up for a vote on uh, December 15th in the House Judiciary Committee, so it probably, that vote will probably already have happened by the time you see this. This bill, what it would do is it would empower authorities to shut down whole websites, even whole domains, based only on the accusation that something on that website, something in that domain, infringed someone's copyright. Uh, law, law professors, First Amendment experts think this is, this is uh, unconstitutional prior restraint. Um, this is opposed by internet engineers, by cybersecurity experts, by tech companies. It's opposed by thousands. Of, there's a million uh, uh, internet users worldwide who have signed a petition against this. The question is who supports this bill? The entertainment industry, or in the cliche version, Hollywood, who just sees the web as another profit center for them. Thing is, this bill makes the domains responsible for all the content on the domain. And by doing that, um, it would mean that um, basically virtually, if not, every site with user content, uh, sites like Facebook, like Twitter, uh, YouTube, Photobucket, uh, political sites like, to use an obvious example, um, Daily Kos, they'd all be faced with a choice. They'd either have to hire thousands upon thousands of people to screen every bit of submitted content for any possible copyright violation before it's posted. They'd have to deploy incredibly intrusive censorship technology, 
or they'd have to ban user content, which in a lot of those cases would mean shutting down the site entirely. And as I've also said, this bill does not stop internet piracy because even if the domain name is blocked, the numeric address, the real URL address, is still available. Uh, this is so bad that the European Union has, the European Parliament rather, has uh, passed a resolution opposing this bill. Now there is an alternative bill, it's sponsored by, it's called the Open Act, it's, uh, it's sponsored by Daryl Issa in the House and Ron Wyden in the Senate. What this bill would do would be to have a specialized uh, uh, panel uh, or agency set up to determine if a site was actually devoted to internet piracy. Uh, and in such cases would direct uh, any place like credit card companies or advertisers and whatnot do any business with the site, they'd have to stop doing it. Now, this is hardly an ideal solution. This is an improvement over, the, over SOPA. It's hardly an ideal solution because remember this is exactly attacking the advertisers and so on. This was exactly the way that WikiLeaks was attacked. So it's still a means of censorship. So it's not ideal. All right, something else to catch on, uh, catch up on. Last week, I talked about Occupy Boston, and I said that uh, Occupy Boston should be safe until December 15th, because on December 1st, there had been a, um, a hearing. There, there was an injunction where the, uh, the police could not remove the demonstrators from the site. There was, a, there was a hearing on that December 1st, and the injunction was extended. The judge gave herself until December 15th to make a final ruling. So everybody's initially expecting it to be on December uh, 15th. Well, it turned out about a day or two after I did the show last week, she lifted the injunction then and didn't wait, and the cops moved in two days later and cleared the place out. Now, most of the occupiers in the face of this had chosen to leave. Uh, but about 40 occupiers decided that this was important enough that they are prepared to be arrested rather than just give up. So the police came and they arrested them and tore everything down. Now, give them credit, unlike some other places, they didn't come in riot gear. But they did come in massive numbers. Uh, one report said there were over 100 cops for every protester. There were about 40 protesters, remember? Another report said that there were like 200 cops. That's like five cops for every protester. Um, and they did come at 5 a.m., so they still came with massive force in the middle of the night. I'm, I still find it hard to believe that anybody thinks that there was not a script that all of these different cities were following in ejecting Occupy sites. Well, Mayor Menino, the next morning, came out praising everybody under the sun. He praised the cops. He praised the protesters. He praised the Occupy movement. He praised everything. He was just full of the milk of human kindness because, oh, well, now those lousy kids are out of my hair. Except they may not be. Uh, there's a saying in the movement that um, evictus we multiply. And Occupy Boston has a whole string of uh, events planned, mostly at uh, neighborhood level events. But in fact, Occupy Boston actually now has its own online radio station. You want to listen to it? It's at www.occupyboston.org slash radio. Okay, if you didn't catch that, email me and I'll give it to you. Um, other Occupy news uh, this past week, there was, of course, the, the port shutdowns in, um, in the West Coast. Uh, this involves San Diego, Long Beach, Oakland, Los Angeles, and California. Uh, it involved Portland, Oregon, there were all, uh, Anchorage, Alaska. There was also one in um, Houston, Texas at these ports. These uh, blockades, if you will, had uh, various degrees of success. Some of the ports were just, they were just like slightly annoyed. Uh, other ones were hindered. Uh, a couple of them had uh, shut down uh, for, the, uh, for a, a shift or sometimes longer. Um, now the, when again, again, remember I just a little bit earlier talked about the, uh, um, the media and media coverage of things. And I've talked before about the, uh, the, the cores of the army of the empire and how the media core provides the propaganda. CNN covered these protests uh, and updated it several times through the day. Um, they did it early. Uh, I know there was an update about 10 p.m. There's an update at like 2.30 the next morning. Uh, 
And it was interesting reading it and noting how the, um, over the course of the day, their early reports kind of said that the thing had fizzled. And it was interesting as these updates came, how they had to increasingly admit that this was bigger than they'd first acknowledged. But CNN, I mean, in their articles and all the updates, they quoted the police, they quoted the directors of various ports, they quoted Oakland Mayor Gene Kwan, um, all of whom were saying that these protests are terrible because they only hurt ordinary working people. Uh, they quoted uh, a trucker who said it only hurts ordinary working people like me. Uh, they noted how the union, the ILWU, had uh, uh, not endorsed this. In all of this, and in all of these updates, they did not talk to one participant. Not, they couldn't find a single participant to talk to. The only thing they had, they had a quote from the website of the organizers. They didn't actually talk to any organizers. They didn't talk to any participants. They only talked to the officials and quoted them. Uh, interestingly, the AP, covering the same events, they managed to find participants to talk to. They actually had a fairly balanced article. Um, because one thing, they noticed that the union didn't endorse the protest, but they also noted that how members of the union cited a provision in their contracts that said, we can ask to, to stay home if we think it's going to be unsafe. And so, oh, there's a protest, it's unsafe. And there's a lot of hints that a lot of this was done in solidarity with the protesters. Uh, and uh, in fact, AP even had truckers who supported the demonstration. Uh, even, even as I said, the one said, it's costing me money, but this is too important. I'm on their side. So somehow CNN managed to not find any of that. Um, on the same day, there were demonstrations in other parts of the country on other issues. Uh, in Denver and in uh, Salt Lake City, the target was uh, Walmart, Walmart distribution centers. In New York City, in the morning, Protesters danced in the atrium of the Winter Garden in Lower Manhattan. They danced until cops came and arrested 18 of them. Earlier in the day, uh, there was a demonstration outside the headquarters of Goldman Sachs. And protesters interviewed another protester um, dressed as a squid. Uh, that's because Goldman Sachs was once described as a squid vampire. So they interviewed a squid. Interestingly, uh, a video done at the uh, protest at Goldman Sachs. There's this video of police preventing a New York Times photographer from taking a picture of an arrest. He's actually, and it's on video, he's actually shoved with baton. Another cop tries to block his view and another cop comes up and literally pushes him, literally pushes him away. All right, back to Boston though. This, uh, this, kind, this kind of thing brings me back to Boston. I said on more than one occasion that it's, it's often it's the little things that get me the most. It's the little things that don't seem to get noticed. And there was something about the Boston Occupy. The day before the police raid, the police blocked food from going into Dewey Square. There was a story about how a plate of ziti was blocked from getting in. And some versions of that story said it was being carried by an 86-year-old woman uh, who was uh, doing it as a support for the Occupy and was threatened with arrest if she brought the ziti into the park. By what authority? I mean, th there's no law in, in, in Massachusetts saying that you can't bring food into Dewey Square. There's no city ordinance that says you can't do that. There's no, um, there's no park regulation that says you can't do that. So by what authority do the police simply say, we decided you can't bring food in there? By what authority do the police simply create law out of thin air on the spot? And nobody seems to be talking about this. We're supposed to, it's just mentioned in passing. As if this is something completely ordinary, completely reasonable, nothing to be, you know, nothing to see here, uh, go about your business, as police literally create a law out of thin air and threaten to arrest people for violating it. You can't bring food in there. Why? There's no law against it. Why can't we? Because I said so. And that's supposed to be good enough. I mean, this, this is really, I mean, it's, 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 to me, it's, it's frightening how we're supposed to accept this kind of abusive, intrusive 
exertion of authority as perfectly ordinary. I mean, failure to disperse people have been arrested on. What kind of charge is that? Failure to disperse. And what does it mean? I mean, if a demonstration is blocking an entrance, if, if they're trespassing, you can arrest them for that. But failure to disperse, does this mean a cop can come up to any gathering of people anytime and just say, you all have to leave, and then they can arrest you if you don't? What does that mean? Failure to obey a legal order, what does that mean? But we're supposed to accept this as just normal. That's just the way it is. Remember, how many, how many of you remember Louis Gates? A couple of years ago, a uh, professor at Harvard who uh, was big national news for a time because he got arrested because he got into an argument with a cop who uh, thought that Gates might have been breaking into his own house. Well, most everybody agreed, well, the cop was wrong to arrest him, and the cop lost it. But a lot of people said how Gates made a rookie mistake, one called it. He argued with a cop. Now, why should we be afraid of arguing with a cop? He's in his own house. He's proved he's in his own house. Why should he be afraid of arguing with a cop? Because we're supposed to assume that cops will abuse their authority and that we'll be victimized by it. We're supposed to just accept this as normal. You know, I have said more than once that there are times when I am glad I will not live long enough to see the world that I see coming. This is one of them. All right, and another thing, get away from that entirely. Um, and another thing is our occasional uh, moments away from politics to something that I just happen to think is cool. And for me, cool is usually going to involve physics or astronomy. So this is something that I think is just really cool. On Tuesday, December 13th, uh, researchers at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, which is known as CERN after its, uh, after its French name, they announced that they discovered hints, tantalizing hints, of the Higgs boson. The what? The Higgs boson. It's named for Peter Higgs, who came up with the idea around mid-1964, as one of several people working on the idea. Um, the Higgs boson is what makes up the Higgs field. The what? The Higgs field. The Higgs field permeates all of space. Um, and they think they've discovered evidence of it. All right, so what? All right, here's the what. In the world of subatomic physics, there are the most accepted model of how things work is called the standard model, cleverly enough. It has a list of, if I recall correctly, 28 fundamental particles that are organized into families. Well, in one way of organizing them, you can say that there are two types of particles. There are fermions, named for Enrico Fermi, an Italian physicist. Um, and these are matter particles. These are electrons. These are quarks. These are the neutrons and protons that are made from quarks. They're particles of matter. And uh, the other ones are bosons. And that's named for, uh, I'm going to forget his name, Satyendra Nath Bose. He's an Indian physicist. Um, and these are particles that carry uh, force. They're the force carries force transmitters. An example of a boson is a photon. Now, I know you've heard of these. A photon is like a particle of light, if you will. And photons are the messengers that carry light energy. Well, the thing is, these particles all have mass. But now, now in case, mass is not here, it's not the same as weight, OK? Weight is mass in a gravitational field. Mass could be better thought of here as resistance to motion, how much energy it takes to move you. So why do these particles have mass? And why do they have the masses they do? And why do they vary so much? The least massive fundamental particle is the electron. The most massive is called the top quark. The top quark is 350,000 times as massive as an electron. This has nothing to do with size. In fact, these particles don't have size. They are point particles, both of them. But one of them, it takes 350,000 times as much energy to move it. Why? Because of the Higgs field. Um, the Higgs field, the idea is that the more a particle interacts with the Higgs field, the more energy it's going to take to move it through that field, and so the more mass it has. 
The Higgs field is why things have mass. That includes not just particles, that includes everything made from all those particles, including you. Why you have mass is because of the Higgs field. Now, this is all well and good, but the thing is the Higgs boson has never been observed. It's very massive. It makes it very hard to find. It's very short-lived, which makes it very hard to find. So it's been, it haven't found any. Uh, the Higgs boson has not been observed yet. So this has been a subject of research and concern because if it turns out you can't find a Higgs boson, if it turns out the Higgs boson doesn't exist, our entire understanding of subatomic physics is wrong. So there's been a lot of concern with finding the Higgs boson. Now, there are hints it may have been found. Now, there's only, uh, they say there's only a 1% chance that they're wrong about this. But in science, especially in subatomic physics, that's not nearly good enough. They don't want a 1% chance they want not, not a 1% chance, they want a 1 10,000th of 1% chance. Not one in a hundred, one in a million. There's still a lot of data for them to go through. Still a lot of accumulated data, and maybe by the time they go through all that data, they'll have enough more to be able to say that, yeah, we found the Higgs boson, and that would be cool. That would be cool. All right, um, last thing. Just very quickly, Bradley Manning, a hero for our times. Bradley Manning has his first pre-trial hearing on, Thursday, uh, on Friday, December 16th. This is the day before his 24th fourth birthday. This is after 18 months of imprisonment. This is his first appearance in court after 18 months of imprisonment, much of that time in solitary confinement um, in conditions that amount to torture under international law. So what I want you to do is I want you to keep a good thought for him. And I'll talk some more about WikiLeaks next week. Also next week, I'm going to talk about the, um, the end of the Iraq War, a uh, little sort of review of uh, uh, our, our history and uh, how that war is, is coming to a very reluctant end. I'm going to wrap up, though, with this. Just as a reminder, this is public access television we're doing here. This is public access. I'm here because there is public access television here in town. This is an opportunity that I had as a resident to bring my views to you, to argue for my views with you, uh, to push for my views. If you have a political view, if you have a hobby, if you have anything, remember, this is public. This is here for you. This is an opportunity, an option, an opening for you to bring your message, whatever it is, how, no matter how serious, no matter how much fun it is, this is an option, for, uh, opportunity for you to bring your voice to the larger community. So you come on down here, okay? This is Carver Community Action TV. Um, you come on down here. They will be very helpful, very friendly. They'll do a great job with you. They help me a sure lot. So this is public. Take advantage of it, okay? Um, so that's it for me. I'm going to get out of here. Um, you just have the best week you can. I will see you next week. And um, best holiday season, too, that you can. Bye.